Hey, Sam. Hey, Bev. Oh, yeah. Such a good sound. It really is. It's the pleasantest of pleasant sounds. It, it is. In my opinion. I mean, I kind of like the cork pop as well, but there's something satisfying about opening a can. Like, even when I open a can of Diet Coke at work, like, I don't know. It just, maybe it just makes me feel like if I'm drinking Diet Coke, that means I'm that much closer to going home and opening something a little more adult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what did you just open over there? So I opened an Orange Blossom by Papico Brewing, which is another brewery in Arizona. Mm. And the Orange Blossom was one of my first favorite beers. Uh huh. Yeah, it's like a orangey vanilla type of flavor, and well, it's so funny. It still says that it's brewed by Papago, but it's actually brewed by Hus Brewing. They just kept the Papago labeling and stuff. I don't know the whole story behind that, but I think Papago is now sort of defunct. The okay. the only beers that they have now are beers that Hus brews for them. So. Yeah, Ew. but it is a delicious beer. What about you? What are you drinking over there? So uh, I have a beer from Bell's Brewery, which um, is a state of Michigan brewery. So bonus for local. Um, but it's called Ladies Larry's Latest Flamingo Fruit Fright. Fruit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Yeah, Larry's Latest Flamingo Fruit Fight. Um, and it is a tart fruit ale brewed with passion fruit and lime. Um, and I just noticed on the can, it said, our latest beer started when two flamingos walked into a bar. You wouldn't believe what happened next. Uh, and that's like the world's largest cliff ha- cliffhanger ever. Um, yeah. But it's, I felt like this, I saw it at the store yesterday and I was like, it is cold as balls. Like today it's negative 15 is what it feels like. So I was like, maybe I'll just pretend like I'm on a beach somewhere and drinking something fruity and it'll make me happy. And it definitely doesn't feel like this beverage goes with what I'm looking at out the window right now, which is snow and cold. (laughs) I mean, that beer sounds delicious. I have one of Larry's, oh shoot, I don't remember which one it is, but it's like a lemon flavored one by Mm. Bell's that has Larry on it. Um, And it's a pretty good one too. So Larry knows what he's doing. Apparently. I didn't realize that like Larry was like a thing that Bell's did. Uh, This is a definite, like I was looking on their website (laughs) trying to find like the nutritional information for it for, (laughs) because I have to track everything with Weight Watchers. So I couldn't find it. So I just guessed based on like some other beers that are similar. And um, this is a seasonal beer. It was in their seasonal section of their website. And it says they only have it like in February, but it's January, but it says distribution subject to change. So I feel like if this isn't out in the summer, I'm going to be very upset, though, because this is a perfect one for, like, floating around in the pool. It's so good. Yeah, I love finding beers like that. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome to We Drink and We Farm Things. Woo! Hi. I'm Sam. And I'm Bev. And this is the Farm Comedy Podcast where we drink and talk about farming things and make a shit ton of mistakes, and then we tell you all about them. We like to think that we have discussions that will provide new knowledge and entertainment, and we go off on so many tangents, so many (laughs) tangents, so many tangents, and if you really like them, you can listen to them on our Patreon. Yes, you can go to patreon.com slash drink and farm, which will be in the show notes, and um, the BS is free for anybody that wants to listen. However, if you want to listen to all of our fun outtakes, which Bev just dumped a ton of them in there. Um, you will have to be a Patreon supporter of at least $2 a month. And with that, not only do you get the outtakes, you get your own RSS link to add to your podcast app. So all of the BS episodes and everything else can just be pulled right into wherever you listen to us. So how fun and convenient is that? That is super, super fun and convenient. And you want to listen to this week's BS. Uh, if you like the podcast, please. Because we actually sort of bs about farm stuff. We did. <laughs> it's like all the crap we couldn't fit in the episode this week. Yeah. We just talked about just like stream of consciousness kind of discussion. We jumped around like the farming things a little bit more. We like to be more organized in the podcast, but it was fun just to 
chat yeah candidly about farming things yeah and we also kind of gave a sneak peek of what we might be talking about at coop camp coop camp so make sure you go check that out if you're interested in finding out what we might talk about yeah and uh our drinks this episode are sponsored by elise ferguson so cheers lady Yes, thank you. And she just got a new Great Pyrenees puppy, and I am so jealous. <laughs> oh, look so cute. So, so I cute. I want to squish its face so much, and I'm so jealous because I want one of those. It's just a timing thing, and I can't have one right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can follow her on Instagram and see her adorable new puppy and everything else that she has going on over at EGF. Brahma Mama, there will be a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> yes, go check her out. So I wanted to do a little bit of follow up this week um, because I saw someone in the Facebook group um, asking about ways to keep the coop a little warmer because there's quite a bit of a cold snap happening right now and lots of snow in, you know, the northern, midwestern, eastern part of the United States. And I meant to go back and answer her, but I couldn't find it. I think it was hidden on a comments log in, like, another place. Um, But since the weather app says it feels like negative 15 today, I thought it would be helpful to remind our listeners that we talked about winterizing the coop and some other how-to-keep-your-coop-warm items in episode 33 titled They Are Both Soft and Squishy, which I have no clue what we were talking about um, in that context, thinking back. But... (laughs) I never remember. (laughs) We talk about some good stuff in that episode. Um, But as far as keeping the coop area warmer, the only thing I'm really comfortable recommending um, is the Cozy Coop flat panel heater. Um, If you think your flock needs some more radiant heat, um, it's totally safe. And the only thing I would personally recommend other than like a nesting box heating pad, just to make sure it's an option for your chickens, you want to put it in a space where they can still get away from it because they might be fine, um, but they'll know if they like the idea of the heater or not because they'll congregate around it. Um, you can either do like freestanding or mount it on a wall or something. Yeah, and we'll link to one of those in the show yes. notes so you can check it out. Um, I have one as well. I actually I don't have it hung in the coop. I just keep it in the barn so that if I have a lone chicken, I have to separate. Oh, yeah. They can keep warm because uh, chickens kind of share body heat on the roosting bar. And when you Mm -hmm. have a chicken hanging out all by itself, it can definitely get cold when it's negative 15 outside. Yes. And, you know, obviously if you have chicks or younger pullets, um, the rules kind of change about heat. But you just want to make sure you don't have a heating lamp in your coop. Because then it might turn into burning down in fried chicken for all. So don't do that. Um, There are alternatives. Just because that's what I recommend doesn't mean it's, you know, the only option. So feel free to do some Googling and let us know if you find some other safe alternatives. Um, But you can also take them some scrambled eggs and oatmeal as warm treats. Um, They like that too. So Yeah, they sure do. You probably don't need to do too much, but just make sure it's not drafty. And they'll probably be okay. I was in my coop today. It was, uh, it wasn't in the negatives this morning, but it's pretty freaking cold. It's like five degrees here. Inside the coop, though, is 27 degrees. Wow. Yeah. Ours is warmer, too. Yeah, it's just from their body heat and the straw and the deep litter going on. And yeah. Yeah. And we talk about um, the deep litter method in that episode 33 as well. And how Bev's managed to do that. So if that's something you're interested in, you can go ahead and take a listen. We'll go ahead and link to it in the show notes just so that you can find it. If you yeah. want that specific episode. It took me a while to scroll to find it. So <laughs> I'm like, wow, we've done a lot of episodes 
pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> we have. Good on you for finding that. One thing I've been experimenting with doing, too, with our episodes is if you're ever looking to see if we've covered a specific topic, there's a search bar on our website, which is drinkandfarm.com, and you can type anything into that search bar. And if we've talked about it, I've likely tagged the episode nice. with it. So if you just want to hear about baby goats, type in baby goats. Or if you just want to hear about winter chicken keeping or coop winterization experiment with different um what's what i'm looking for uh word combinations yeah word combinations that would that would bring that up and those episodes will come up hopefully (laughs) they should yes (laughs) you can always reach out to us too if you're not sure if we've talked about something at all and we'll do the digging for you if you can't find it Yeah, we usually remember what we've talked about. We just can't remember when it happened. No. <laughs> and we're totally happy to answer you. So, yeah, let us know. And if we haven't talked about it yet, maybe we'll add it to our list of things that we'll talk about on another yeah. podcast episode. So there. Good idea. So we got our January Honey and Rue boxes. Woo! Cue egg song noises of excitement. How does that go? Buck, 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 buck. Basically. <laughs> but then, like... Like, one will be doing it, and then somebody else will join in. And, and, you know, then the rooster starts running around with excitement. So proud of his ladies. Like, that level of excitement in my heart happens when I see that our lovely post person has dropped off the honey and rue box. Yeah, I was really excited to get mine this month, especially because it had a hen scarf in it. Uh, yes, and I totally wore that to the store yesterday. Because the one I got is, like, I don't know if everybody got, like, the light pink color. Mine is mint. See? Okay. I thought so. Because I think I saw a picture of you with it. And I was like, it looks different than mine. But mine goes really good with my my olive green winter jacket. So I was feeling pretty fancy at the store yesterday. Just saying. Well, and if you are a subscriber and you want the other color also, you can order them from Henny and Rue's website. So I think I'm going to go on there and get myself the other color just because I, I can't have too many hen scarves, right? I love scarves. They're my jam. And yeah. I feel like that one's subtle enough that you can wear it anywhere and people will have to like get real in your business to notice what it is. <laughs> it's like a secret <laughs> hen scarf. <laughs> yes. <sighs> so would you say that was your favorite thing in this month's box? Yeah, I I would definitely say so. Um, And I managed to fold it so that I could just tie a little knot behind my neck. And it looks like a triangle scarf. Oh. Yeah, because it's like a long rectangular uh, style scarf. So those are a little trickier to get to do that. But I laid it out on the bed and sort of finagled it around. And I was like, there we go. Because I don't know why. I prefer the point going down on the front. Um, Maybe it's because I wear a lot of vests. So it helps add like different like layers of clothing when I don't have it all up on my neck if that makes sense yeah that is fair not that I'm super fashionable or anything but (laughs) I mean you know as long as you're happy with how you look does it really matter you know what anybody else thinks no it definitely doesn't so what was your favorite thing out of the box would you say it was the scarf also um yeah but I don't want to say the favorite thing for both of us is the same thing So I'll go with my second favorite thing. Just for pure entertainment purposes, um, I did a little Henny and Rue photo shoot. And I took the little coop cup that was in there and put it on the side of the box to get them to all come hang out with me. Um, And I put some of the Hintastic Mealworm and Oregano treats in there. To get them to like congregate and be adorable and because it was just so funny how aggressive they were pecking at it to get the food and not be able to like like they just didn't want to share um (laughs) so apparently you're supposed to use it for water but it is treat tested by my chickens and they adored it so i thought that was really cool because you could put that on the side of the cage if you have a hen that's like in the hospital um or that you just need to separate for a little bit. It's super convenient that to have that little cup that'll be stationary. Because I know when I've put waters in like a smaller space, um, they step on them. They get stuff in them like way easier. Especially since they're used to the over-the-head nipple waters in the coop. So I thought that was just really handy to have for 
isolation purposes. Yeah, and you know, this is the second thing that we've gotten in our Henny and Rue boxes that were really useful for that. The first one is like a little tiny blue cup Mm -hmm. that goes into it it fits within like the perfect bar spacing on a crate yes so i have several different crates and it works on all of them and i put a grit in it for chicks Ooh. so now that black cup is gonna get used inside the chick brooder my chick brooder is actually crates i i only use the tub for while they're teeny teeny tiny and as soon as Mm -hmm. they can't fit through the bars anymore they move to a crate so i'm going to put their food in it because otherwise they walk into or roost on those triangle shaped feeders Mm -hmm. do you know what i'm talking about Mm -hmm. and then they get poop like all over the food or they kick the food out and then poop on it and it's worthless but in that hanging cup they'll be able to walk up to it and peck into it and get the food out and they'll have to like flap and fly up there to get into it and i and i think young chicks are less likely to try to do that yeah I agree. I mean, we'll see. That's like purely <laughs> speculation. But <laughs> anything to waste less feed. I mean, I waste so much feed around here. So <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, we do too. We've we've managed to create a feeder that's um, prevented some waste, but there's still kind of a holes about it sometimes. But um, then I would say like. Also on the box that was really cool that I already mentioned were those treats because they have oregano in them and oregano is a natural antibiotic. So I might actually reserve those treats to when I think somebody needs a little boost. Um, That's a good idea. So when I have them separated, they can feel like they're getting a special treat. I usually do some kind of Greek yogurt or something like, you know, special when they're separated like that because it encourages them to eat. So I think these little treats would be a nice little addition to to their little regiment that they go on for a little bit. Yeah, and the, another thing that we got in the box were the Epsom salts with lavender. Um, but I'm not going to lie, I totally took those for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it too, because but then I read that you use like the whole bag in one in like one tub. Yep. And I'm like, oh my god. Maybe I will reserve this. We'll see. <laughs> well, I still have some of the um, salty egg bombs from Messy Mildred. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, the chickens don't need this, but I don't have any of this. So I'm going to use it for myself because the box <laughs> is for me and the chickens. So I get to pick what's good for me. <laughs> well, and I noticed on, and maybe I haven't noticed this and or it's a new thing, but I've noticed on the card that explains what everything is, she broke it down for what was for you and what was for the chicken. And I feel like there needed to be a third column for interchangeable. Because <laughs> there are always some interchangeable things, right? <laughs> I mean, I could put that hen print scarf on one of my hens and it would be adorable. True. You know? So true. <laughs> but, uh, also in the box, there was a layer boost supplement for omega-3, which can help the quality and quantity of eggs. So I feel like that'll be a little interesting thing to test out. I'm going to save it for when my waters are less likely to freeze because even with the heaters right now, with how cold it is, sometimes they still freeze um, and I don't want to waste it. So yeah, I'm having that same problem over here too. Yeah. And I loved getting a pair of latex gloves in it as well um, so that I can put the latex gloves inside my little portable uh chicken first aid bag which was Mm -hmm. something else I got in a henny and rue box from a long time ago you tell I've just been like collecting henny and rue things (laughs) oh my gosh yes and putting together like whole kits for specific things having just one pair of sterile gloves that slide into that bag is going to be so much easier than the box of gloves that I have like in a cart Mm -hmm. full of first aid stuff so yeah like gloves on the go for when you have to grab your first aid kit and run because, you know, that happens every now and then. Yes. And then I thought it was really cute, too, uh, to have the chicken keeping journal in there. You can obviously use that for multiple re- things like wish lists or things that have worked well, things that haven't worked well. If you want to keep track of, like, egg production per day, um, anything chicken related, I might honestly just take mine to work and carry it around with me. Um, to take down notes at work because it'll make me happy because I know it's like a chicken thing. But we'll see. Maybe maybe I'll use it for its intended purpose. <laughs> I was thinking of using mine as like my farm gratitude journal. 
Oh, that's a cute idea. Because like everybody or I've heard that everybody should be keeping a gratitude journal just so that at the end of the day, you're writing down the things that you're thankful for. And it just kind of puts you to bed at the right mood. Yeah, so, it's probably a good idea. I should probably start doing that. <laughs> yeah, and I don't either. My husband's really good about it. He's he's always like on top of the latest like thing that's supposed to make your life just feel a little more fulfilling. And mm. I'm like, I went to bed last night without washing my face and I stayed up until midnight and oh, I probably need to drink more water. <laughs> like, so basically, I'm slowly killing myself. <laughs> I mean, you know, I doubt you're slowly killing yourself, but you should. Yes, self-care is important. At least you have a good role model over there, like, to encourage you or or maybe it irritates you because he's so good at it and he doesn't have to try. I feel like it could have either effect on me depending on my mood. Right, yeah. It probably changes depending on my mood. (laughs) That's fair. But no, I like that idea because the book is like cute and t- like small enough that it could easily go on a nightstand and not take up an obnoxious amount of space. Yeah. Well, in February, uh, there's going to be something super cool inside it that I'm really excited about. And that is a tote that has watercolor painted hens on it. And it's just so adorable. She comes up with the coolest stuff. I don't know where she finds all this neat stuff from. I don't know either. I feel like she probably just spends her days like Googling and Pinteresting and reaching out to really cool brands and people. And she's just, I mean, she's hooked us up with some cool people to talk to. So I feel like she's just got like oodles and oodles of connections. Yeah. I feel like Tina at Henny and Rue is like one of the coolest people I know. Yeah. <laughs> no well, offense, Bev. You are too. <laughs> and I'm, I'm the second coolest person you know. <laughs> I mean, we can pretend like you guys are tied for first, but I think you would think Tina Tina's cooler than me too. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> We're all equally cool. (laughs) Yeah, there we go. I like that. Um, You can get the February box, though, um, by going to honeyandrue.com. And if you use our code DRINKANDFARM, you'll get 10% off your first box when you subscribe so that you don't miss out on the cool, awesome tote. Barn and coop maintenance doesn't stop when winter hits and it's cold as balls. It just means that your animals may have more roommates in the form of nasty little bugs. Yeah, and that is why we use First Saturday Lime to repel mites, lice, and fleas that may be hiding in your animal's bedding to stay warm. You can also pour First Saturday Lime around your barn or coop to control bacteria, moisture, and ammonia, all while keeping the stink down. Yes, so go to firstsaturdaylime.com and use code DRINK to save 20% off of your order. This month, I've been, like, really focusing on trying to get all of my farm stuff in order, like, you know, to legitimize my herd because I've got some registered goats and to figure out how to get a breeding program started. And Mm -hmm. I wish I would have looked up what episode it was that we talked about this, but it was only a couple episodes ago. We talked about um, using an outside stud service for breeding. And um, I found a place that will test your whole herd for the scary goat diseases that we talked about on that episode. Oh, it's called Yonis. It was just like two episodes <laughs> ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and it's sageaglab.com. So you can draw your goat's blood and send it in to this lab and they'll do the whole panel for you so that you can prove that your goat is free from the big three diseases. That is awesome. Yeah. So I've got a couple of videos that we'll link in the show notes and it shows you how to draw the goat's blood properly for this type of test Mm -hmm. and um, there will also be a link in the show notes to sage ag lab so that you can get the proper form and um, their address and the proper shipping information and whatnot if you decide that you need to do this for your herd as well but the diseases that sage ag labs tests your goats for are cae 
CL and Yonis. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard to say Yonis. You have no idea how bad I wanted to say Johans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just sitting here like Johans, and I was like, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it's $17 for a goat for the whole panel, which is a pretty decent deal. I'll be able to test my entire herd for, I think it's $87. That's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Um, And they'll also do a pregnancy test, which is $6.50 per goat, which I feel like is a pretty reasonable price to pay to like find out if your goat sexy time actually took, (laughs) Um, especially if you're using an outside stud. Yes. You know, that you don't have access to all the time. You want to know if your goat's pregnant. So. Right. Pretty handy. Uh, but I'm not going to lie. Drawing the blood from the goat's jugular looks so freaking scary. It's not even funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. I might have to watch that video because I'm going to have to do shots and all that fun stuff with new goats. And uh, I just, yeah, for money saving purposes, it's just going to be easier to do it here. So any kind of blood draw needle thing. For me, I used to get really woozy when people would talk about blood draw. Just talk about it. Like, I'd feel like I was going to pass out and have to put my head down. So I've come a long way that I don't pass out when I get blood drawn anymore. But it's going to be like a whole different level for me if I can successfully do that stuff on an animal. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things about keeping animals and about keeping animals that aren't like, common quote-unquote pets Mm -hmm. is that you kind of got to learn how to do some scary things and if you're not a nurse or a vet tech or you don't work in a field where you deal with needles and blood or you know like sticking things into living beings that sounds really (laughs) it does it sounds super (laughs) dirty but you know what I mean I do, but I had to point it out because it's our podcast and it was getting too serious. Right, yeah. (laughs) It's scary as hell. Yes, it is. You got to get over doing the scary things because you're like, am I hurting them? Am I bothering Mm -hmm. them? Like, am I doing this right? Like, you're not going to do everything perfect the first time. There's going to be mistakes, but like, it's good to learn how to do these things if you are going to keep livestock animals absolutely because like i can take my dogs out to go get all of this stuff done but it's not as easy to take my goats out because there just aren't as many places to do it right and when you have like five goats and you need it done on all of them it's like is it more expensive it's probably more expensive to take them to somebody else to do it because you're paying them for their time and for everything that they're doing to the goat yeah, so, n- not to mention I got to get five goats in my car. <laughs> yeah, or you need to have a vet that'll come on site to help you out. So. Yeah, and I mean, if I lived closer to a big town, I'd probably be able to get that. But where I'm at now, I mean, I don't know of anybody, so I don't know. Um, but I ordered a blood draw kit from Sage Ag Labs, and it's on its way here. So... It comes with, like, the proper type of needle that you need for the type of blood draw and the plunger, like, tubes and everything. It gives you the instructions on how to label them. So you can probably get those things from anywhere, but I decided just to order it from them since that's where I'm sending the Mm -hmm. samples to so that I knew I was, you know, getting the proper vessels and whatnot. Right. And we'll see how it goes. So hopefully in a few weeks I'll be updating everybody on how the blood draw went. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you need Jared to take some videos of that so we, <laughs> so we can watch. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to have my kids uh, do it because you can't do a blood draw on the milking stand. Oh, that'll be yeah, fun. Yeah, when you watch the video, you'll understand why because you like you have to tilt their head back mm-hmm. and you actually like stick it into their jugular. It shows you how to find their jugular vein and put the needle in and then you pop the tube on the bottom of the needle. Ugh. Um it's really neat, like, how fast and easy it is. And the goats don't look like they mind whatsoever. So that oh. made me feel a little better. Yeah, definitely. And play your kids. Hopefully it doesn't traumatize them. But <laughs> nah, they, you they can tell fine. them you can do hard things. <laughs> you can watch mom do hard things. <laughs> mom can do hard things. You can watch me do hard things. It's all good. Everybody's mm-hmm. going to be fine. Yes. Mm-hmm. So seems like 
there was a uh, forward movement on, you know, us taking over the moon someday. Or maybe, maybe not us, but maybe China taking over the moon someday. Does anybody own the moon? We have a flag on the moon, and I heard oh, that if true. you like it, then you have to put a flag on it. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> China actually were you know landed on the far side of the moon on January 3rd. Oh, that's the dark side. Yes, that is the first time anybody has landed anything on the far side of the moon. And actually, that landing is the first time humanity has landed anything on Earth's natural satellite since 2013. So the reason we're talking about this is because China successfully started growing something on said probe that landed on the moon. Yeah, cotton of all things. Yes. Weird, right? But kind of interesting. Yeah, it was an interesting choice of plant. Um but I suppose if the goal is eventual colonization of the moon, you would want to make sure that you can create textiles up there. Yeah. Yes, that does make sense. I feel so, like food should have been first, though. <laughs> like corn or yeah, soybeans. I don't, or... I don't know. Is cotton like really easy and hearty like kind of choice for something to grow in such a hostile environment maybe that's why yeah i have no idea i've never tried to grow it so i I Mm. can't i can't speak on that i can't either (laughs) but i mean we have a hard enough time growing things on earth so (laughs) i know that's why this article was kind of interesting to me because it's like i can grow herbs and that's about it so far um so how are you gonna grow something in a way less like i guess we could call it a controlled environment up there because it is what it is but it's not like they took it outside and tried to plant it. So basically, they were growing it within the probe, right? Yeah. So they got it to sprout within a couple of days, and China made this huge announcement. They were so excited about it. But one of the purposes of the mission was to test whether plants could grow in a low-gravity environment. So the system they sent up there started to water the seedlings after the probe landed, and then less than a week later, a green shoot had already appeared. Which is pretty dang cool. Yeah, that is super cool. And this isn't the first time that humans have started growing plants in space. Um, They've just never attempted to grow them on the moon before. So you can actually Google, like, growing plants in space and see some really, really cool photos of people in a space station growing plants. And you'll see, like, the plant. And then in the background, you'll see, like, Earth. Um, So that's a pretty (laughs) cool thing to Google if you're interested in seeing that. (laughs) But I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the people's names on these articles because they're Chinese and I'll just slaughter them. So if you guys want to learn more, we're going to we'll link to the show notes and the couple of articles um, that were provided that we got this content from. But it is worth pointing out that the main dude on this, um, he said that this mission has achieved the first biological experiment on the moon of human history to sprout the first bud on the desolate moon. And with time moving on, it'll be the first plant with green leaves on the moon. So China was like really freaking excited, which they should be, right? Because, you know, we're learning how life develops in low gravity and strong radiation environments. And it could even help provide a blueprint for growing resources during a future moon colony established by humans. But... Just a few days after China, like, was really excited about this, um, they abruptly ended the experiment and and they shut down the power remotely. So I'm not sure that the green leaves ever sprouted, but there was definitely potential there. Yeah, they didn't give any indication why they shut the the program down. (laughs) I didn't find anything, but I didn't, like, these articles are from CNN. I didn't, like google further of why maybe they did it and i don't know china could be hiding why they did it too because you know i really like conspiracy theories so in my brain that's where it goes to naturally with a lack of research that i did (laughs) but it could have just been that something went wrong and they had to shut the power down (laughs) yeah i mean it was the dark side of the moon it might be a less hospitable environment for probes to land i mean space is sort of a unpredictable 
area in general, you know, just with yeah. all the gravity issues and random rocks flying around and things being crazy cold and then crazy hot all right. in the same like hour. Yeah. I mean, the smart scientist dude did say that inside the biosphere, it was like really erratic and reached extreme like temperatures that would kill all life, including seeds and eggs. So it says in here in the article that they had two temperature controlling plates, but the temperature was still above 30 degrees Celsius, which is 86 degrees around 1030 AM on the moon. Um, As everybody knows, many plants can't sprout in that temperature, but they didn't really confirm why temperatures had risen to that level. Um, you know, despite all of the measures they took to send the proper equipment up there. And then they just terminate, terminate everything. And it's worth pointing out that this mission was supposed to be 100 days long. And it only made it nine days in. So that's like almost 10%. That's not yeah. the worst. It's not the worst, but I mean, I didn't find how much money they spent to do this, but (laughs) (laughs) it was a lot. (laughs) And then this article like went on to say that, you know, China's aggressively trying to get to Mars by 2020. Whoa. So, yeah. So I don't know if they're like, this is good enough for us to say that this might work out. So (laughs) screw it. We're just going to go to Mars. And as the astronaut, I'd be like, wait, no, I want to make sure your shit works first. <laughs> like, well, e- can we make e- sure we yeah. don't go above, you know, I mean, I don't know, 86 doesn't seem like it's that hot. Uh, no, it, no. It is kind of hot for plants, but it, I mean, I grew stuff in Phoenix. It's 115 there on average in the summertime. So right. you can grow plants and hotter than that. Tons of people do it. And I'm sure we have some listeners that even do that. So if people in Arizona are going, ha, 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 in Texas and Florida. And yeah. And that's why I'm kind of like calling bullshit a little <laughs> bit because they're kind of vague yeah. on all of this. And of course, if like something was going really, really wrong, I don't see the Chinese government admitting it. Um, you yeah, know, probably just not. like, just like the U S would probably cover it up a little bit. Like, I'm not just calling out that government. It's like any government, like they want to save face and look good. So maybe it was something that isn't as apparent to us that had nothing to do with the poor little cotton plant that's now dead and shriveled up on the moon. Well, and maybe whatever it was, was so complicated that normal lay people like us, <laughs> we weren't going to understand it anyway. So they were like, why confuse the plebes with those We'll just yeah, yeah, tell yes. him it broke. <laughs> yes. Um, but if you want to learn more about what you know, NASA is doing to learn about growing plants in space, specifically Mars, um, there was this really cool article I found on The Verge um, that we'll link to in the show notes where they talk about how they're trying to figure out how to grow things on Mars. Um, obviously, NASA hasn't seen the movie The Martian because um, Mark Watney totally killed it with some potatoes. And then the Mars atmosphere ripped through his little greenhouse and killed everything instantly. So I'm a little more skeptical. Obviously, The Martian is a movie, but. I you mean that like wasn't based on a true story? I felt like it was, honestly. It's a, it's a really good movie. <laughs> it is. It's a great movie. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> So everybody watch The Martian. Me too. Yes. <laughs> Go watch it. Um, but I, I didn't want to like dive into the article on The Verge just in case people have like no interest in growing things not on Earth. Um, we just thought this would be a fun little deviation from, you know, talking about homesteading on Earth to potentially homesteading on a more hostile environment. I mean, can I just say, though, in like the span of a generation – People have gone from the very first car to ever be, like, mass manufactured to talking about the possibility of homesteading on the moon. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. It's a pretty incredible time to be alive. Like, just, like, the leaps and bounds that we make from, in, in, like, all aspects of things continues to blow my mind. I agree. It's crazy, the rate of technology But if you think about it, I feel like the difference in technology or the aggressiveness of like the space programs 
over the last like 70 years hasn't really advanced that much. Yeah, and I mean, part of that is probably funding. Yes, and maybe we never actually landed on the moon. Oh, no, come on. <laughs> I had to go there. I no, had to. We those landed are my, on the moon. <laughs> those are my favorite, like, conspiracy things to watch. And oh while we're gosh. at it, the Earth is flat. And it no. is Beverly. <laughs> the space station photos lie. <laughs> Are they even in a space station? I doubt it. No, they're in a hot air balloon. They just went really, really high. (laughs) They're really in a movie studio with the right kind of lighting. (laughs) It's all about the lighting. All about the lighting. (laughs) Hey, Bev, do your chickens like to party? Because mine do, especially with a Grubbly's treat tank. The treat tank contains five pounds of grublies stored in a bucket designed to keep your grubs fresh and safe for your chickens. And bonus, it'll fit up to 10 pounds. So you can like order a ton of grublies and stuff that thing full. Oh, dang. Also, I think it's worth mentioning that it is 100% weather and pest proof. And it has a convenient handle at snack time. And I love this thing because we have like a huge mice problem in our garage and it keeps the grublies away from the little mice and saves them just for our flock. You can save 15% off of your treat tank with code FARM15 and you can save 10% off your treat tank refills by subscribing for your grublies in the tubblies. If you want to learn more about the genesis of Grubbly Farms, make sure you check out the mini so Drink and Grubbly. We interviewed the Grubbly gang and learned about how the company started in a laundry room of a college apartment. So make sure you go check it out. So we don't have any new farm stories yet. We're going to encourage you to send them in at the end of this episode, though. Don't worry. But I figured on the episodes where we don't have a farm story, we're just going to interject with our own farm stories. That works. Right? Yeah. Well, if you saw my stories, you may have seen that I trimmed the goat's hooves yesterday. And I actually highlighted the story. So if you go to my Instagram, which is at Ross Roost Farm, you'll be able to watch it since it's available all the time if you don't know how the highlights thing works. But yeah, long story short, the milking stand totally made trimming the goat's hooves easier. But they didn't jump on it like we thought they would. So (laughs) we're going to have to build like some stairs or a ramp or something. We we had to pick each goat up. (laughs) Which is going to be really hard when they get bigger. Because like you've seen how big Nigerian dwarf goats get pretty rotund is that the right word uh yeah (laughs) ours are little fatties and i'm pretty sure well cal's still kind of overweight he's probably pushing 100 pounds so trying to like squat down and pick him up is like a nightmare (laughs) so yes we'll have to but but they do jump up on a pallet thing that we built that would be about the same height um as a milk stand if not a little taller so i feel like they're used to jumping up Because they know they get treats when they jump up. So maybe we've already conditioned them with that. You might have. We were trying to, like, get ours to do it. Like, even put the grain inside, like, a little (laughs) dish. And then, like, put it in their nose. And then picked it up to try to get them to get up. But they were a little, like, standoffish about it. (laughs) I've totally seen them jump on on bigger things, though. They were just like, what is this weird thing you want us to jump on? And then we tried using leashes. And that made them very unhappy also (laughs) oh my goodness yeah in the video you can see one of our goats like actually pancaked when we put her on the milking stand she like tucked all of her legs under her and like flopped it was so cute and I was like oh man she is protesting so hard well that same goat did the same thing when we put a leash on her this morning because my husband was like we've got to be able to make this easier so we tried leashes and The leash worked better because then we didn't have to chase them when they got scared of the milking stand. But, I mean, everybody got calm on the milking stand once they figured out there was grain in there for them. It was just showing them that it wasn't a terrifying contraption. (laughs) (laughs) So milking stands take some training. It's not like the end-all be-all of easy goat keeping, that's for sure. (laughs) But at least you're getting them started now. So then when it's time to actually milk them, they'll be a little more familiar with it. Whereas mine, they don't, we don't even have one built yet and we're going to have to start milking in probably like a couple, like 
sooner than I think in my brain. <laughs> yeah, you're like, as we record, it is January 20th and their due date is like the end of February. So. Yeah. <sighs> oh, it's so hard yeah. to like get all the things all set up. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did trim the goat's hooves and I feel super guilty admitting this and I really hate admitting this, but this is only the second time we've trimmed our goat's hooves since we've had them. Mm -hmm. Um, because trimming their hooves is actually way more overwhelming than I thought it was going to be. Like, yeah, I, I agree with that. It's not my favorite thing to do. Um, and we usually let our, ours go longer than it probably should for that reason. So I will admit that. (laughs) So you are not alone. (laughs) Okay, good. It's nice to know that I'm not alone. I mean, no. So one thing that's been nice, and this isn't like to tell people that, they should let their goats go too long it's just that if you have been like a you're not by yourself in it but b i haven't had any like serious issues from it like we've had Mm -hmm. a little bit of the um the hoof growing inward so it started to look kind of like shoes yeah we've had that too before and it if it's almost like a balance. You want it to like be long enough where it's like it's pretty easy to get to and trim, but there's kind of a delicate balance, especially with like Cal, because he's like I said, he's probably push- pushing like a hundred pounds. Um, his will curl over much faster just because of his weight. Yeah, and then that's much harder to take care of. Yeah, for sure. And what happens when it starts to curl under like that is rocks get caught in it, but also Mm -hmm. like the nasty stuff that they walk in out in their pasture and inside their barn stall. So it's filled with like poop and mud and straw and and all of that stuff. If if you end up with like a soft spot in the bottom of the hoof or anything like stabs into it and causes like a an injury it can end up really doing like permanent damage to yeah. a goat's hoofs so that's why it's good to look at them and trim them so that you know whether or not an issue is starting so you don't end up with a lame goat right yeah so there's my i have been totally terrified of taking proper care of my goats but i'm trying really hard to do it right now and here's why you should do if you've been terrified of it as well <laughs> No, I, I'm the same way too. So, and, and it's not a one person job when they're closer to full size, like when they're babies, like the breeder that I got them from did a little hoof trim before she gave them to us. Um, and she made it look so damn easy because she's got like a shit ton of goats or she did at the time, but like it, it, it's not an easy task to do, but it seemed like watching you with your milk stand experience that did help you know once they kind of calmed down and let you do what you had to do oh yeah yeah it 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 totally helped it made me feel more confident because I wasn't afraid of them running away while I was doing Mm -hmm. it because I couldn't go anywhere (laughs) right yes super helpful and yeah even with the milking stand it was still a two-person job my husband was uh brushing them the whole time Oh, okay. While I was trimming their hooves because we thought that the extra like touch stimulation would distract them from the fact that I was picking up a foot. Okay. Because yeah, you know how your brain does that like with the wiring? Yeah. I don't know if goats work the same as humans, but we thought it was worth a shot. <laughs> it doesn't hurt to try it out because I feel like it. it's probably each goat reacts differently to it. Like I definitely noticed that in when we trim ours because I've been holding them while my husband trims or vice versa. And some of them chill out after a while. Like Cal does better outside if I'm holding him and sitting outside because it's cooler and he likes the hug. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause he's warmer and he stays still, but if he's inside, he's just a real asshole about it. So you kind of got to figure out what works for you and your, and your little flock. Yeah. Herd. Oh, herd. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, the same can be applied for chickens, I think, too, in different circumstances. True. Fair enough. So, quick question, though. This is sort of a side tangent, but it's a farm side tangent. Mm. Did you notice that your goats that were professionally trimmed by the breeder the first time, do you feel like their hooves tend to, like, grow a little nicer than the Um, ones that you were the first one to do the trimming? mm, No. Okay. I don't think so. Because I think back to, like, because Toots only ever had us 
do his nails and his are pretty much the same okay. unless like we're just really good at it i was gonna say <laughs> you guys might just be really good at it i i just noticed that while i was trimming them uh, my two that the breeder had until they were eight or nine weeks he was the first one to do a trim on oh. them so their hooves they've always been super easy and they've had way less growth and they have less stuff stuck in their hooves than the ones where i was the first one to do the trim <laughs> Interesting. Well, are the two that he held on to, how, do they have the same parents? They do not. Nope. Oh, I was going to say, I wonder if it's like genetic or something. Yeah, that's a good question. Interesting. Maybe we'll have to ask Erica the goat chick when we interview oh, yes. her about that. Hmm. Hmm. Always more stuff to learn. It was good just an question. observation that I made. Maybe I'm really terrible at trimming though. <laughs> but I'm learning. I'm working on it. I'm trying not to be too hard on myself. I, I'm still, like, really hesitant with it. I'm awkward. Like, my husband does a way better job than I do. But I'm trying to, you know, practice more when it's that time to go do it. Because that's the only way we're going to get better is if we practice. And through practice, you'll gain confidence. Yep, that's true. But my confidence did waver a little bit because I over-trimmed one of our goat's hooves and totally made her bleed. And it felt really awful Yeah, we've done it. that before, too. Yeah, I mean, but that's how you learn your limits, right? Yeah, because, you know, you're watching those videos and you see them taking off, like, big, huge chunks. So you're like, oh, yeah, I yeah. can totally get this done faster if I take off bigger chunks. Maybe I'm being too meticulous about it. So then I do it and then I'm like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> like, there's blood <laughs> everywhere. Like, this is not good. And my husband's going, oh, it's not supposed to do that. It's not supposed to do that. I'm like, yeah, I know it's not supposed to Thanks, do that. Thanks, genius. <laughs> <laughs> See, you've read the communication book. I haven't yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 did you do once you realized that you cut too close? I just slapped some blue coat on it and I wrapped her whole hoof in gauze and then wrapped the whole thing in vet wrap like okay. all around it and then like I'm I'm moving my hands around like you can see me. <laughs> wrapping it like crisscross across and then across the other way so that I got the bottom Mm because I didn't want the gauze underneath it to soak up like nasty stuff from the barn okay so yeah I totally wrapped it in vet wrap it it looks like a perfect little vet wrap hoof (laughs) it did I saw the picture and honestly like when I was watching the videos of you trimming the hooves you looked like you really knew what you were doing oh good Um, because I saw like you were taking off good amounts and seemed pretty confident about what you were doing and then I saw the little cute little hoof all wrapped up because like we did that with tutors as well like one of the first times we trimmed his hooves it was just a little too short and we wrapped it up just like you did and I mean that did not last long with him because he's a rambunctious little boy but um you know, it kind of made me feel better that it at least stopped bleeding. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we'll take the bandage off tomorrow. We'll just leave it on for a couple of days. I just want it to scab over so that it mm-hmm. can't soak in um, bacteria exactly. and whatnot. So that's it. And yeah. the blue coat was just so that if there was still some, like, um, urine or feces or nasty, disgusting dirt things on mm-hmm. the cut, that should have killed all of that, you know, stuff so that it didn't end up getting into the wound, hopefully. Yes. Thank goodness for a blue coat. (laughs) Right. So far, she's looking great. Uh, My hand is covered in blue coat. It will be for several days. Yes. And that is just the sign of a homesteader. (laughs) It's my homesteading (laughs) fashion trend. Um, But the reason why I tell this story about chopping off um, a hoof too far and causing bleeding is because, like, so there's lots of how-to videos and how-to like pages for homesteading and stuff. And I feel like they always use the terms like owning these animals is really hard work. But like, I feel like that's sort of obvious. Like we know that it's hard work, but something that doesn't get said very often is that it's mentally hard work. It's like mentally scary to cut. Cause like I don't even trim my own dog's nails. Right. I have a groomer do that. Because mm-hmm. I'm afraid of cutting the quick. Yeah. But, same. But, like, you can't do that with goats. There's not, there's not, like, a goat manicurist out there. Like, I can't take my goat in <laughs> for grooming. I have to do maybe, all that myself. <laughs> maybe you, that's your new business. You can just be a goat groomer and you could have, like, a 
a creepy windowless van, but make it really cute with paint and stuff (laughs) and just have a mobile washing trimming goat station pop out of it. (laughs) If I lived in like an urban area, I'd totally do that because I'm sure that there's (laughs) urban homesteaders that want to have goat milk and stuff, but don't want to have to worry about this kind of stuff because like chances Mm -hmm. are if they're urban, they also have outside jobs like we do, which can make some of the stuff semi overwhelming. Like if my outside job was... Uh, grooming dogs or being a veterinarian or a veterinarian's assistant or a nurse or something like that. Like I just, I feel like those, those jobs lend to just being braver about stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. I'm an accountant. Nobody bleeds when I mess up (laughs) (laughs) at my work. No, you just stab fish with trackers, right? No, I actually, I don't do that, but I, they did. But you did did once. Yeah, I did once and then they (laughs) never let me do it again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, but look at you now trimming goat hooves and you're going to be drawing blood and doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I'm learning. I always did want to be a vet when I grew up. Me too. Um, I think that I was afraid of messing up though. Like once I figured out that like it could mean life or death in emergencies, I was like, oh no, I can't handle that. Yeah, me, I'm just really bad at math and not so great at science. And that's like all it is to get to that point. So I didn't do it for that reason. (laughs) Well, that totally makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) That's why you're the math lady and I'm not. (laughs) Well, we have some housekeeping. Yes. Yeah, don't turn it off because we've got some important stuff to share with you. Yes, but we'll be brief. We will. We will be super brief. We have got this down. Coop Camp dates have been announced and they are June 7th through 9th. And like we are running out of time for early bird costs. Um, The early bird cost is $110. It ends January 30th, which is just a handful of days after this episode drops. Um, You can still go and sign up after January 30th. It'll just cost you a little more money. And we don't know how much that is yet. Yeah. So this year it's going to be um, just outside of Indianapolis. And in order to check out the ticket situation, go to www.fadedjeans.tv slash coop dash camp dot html. That'll also be in the show notes so you don't have to remember to type all that in. Yeah. And don't forget to take our survey. There is a link to that in the show notes. The survey is super helpful to us because you can give us feedback on what you think of the way that we do the show. And sometimes we'll implement it and sometimes we don't. But we've implemented a lot of feedback that we've received. And honestly, I think it's made the show better. For sure. Um, Another way for you to hang out with us and give us good information um, is to join our Facebook group. So if you search We Drink and We Farm Things on Facebook, it'll come right up and you'll be able to answer a few questions. We'll let you in if you're not a spam bot or the Illuminati and you will be able to hang out with us, post, answer other people's questions Um, We've had some fun stuff in there this week, so make sure you go join and check that out. And review us in all the places. And if you really like us, subscribe to our podcast. And when you listen, if you download, that helps give us better information on how many people are listening. Because like actual listener numbers are hard to count. Downloads are easy. Yes. So if you really like us, let us take up some space on your phone temporarily. And, you know, that that sort of thing keeps this podcast going. Uh, also, we sell merch. I make things uh, from our that you can buy from our website. And your purchase helps support the podcast. So there's some wine tumblers on there. There's um, some cool stickers that somebody else made that we're selling. Um, there's all sorts of stuff on there. So make sure you go to drinkandfarm.com slash shop and check everything out. Yeah, and you can also buy a bunch of merch that Sam doesn't make, and that's over at drinkandfarmmerch.com. There's hoodies, camping cups, tank tops, like tons of really cool stuff. So if you like our show, you like our cute little goat and rooster booster mascot, you'll definitely want to go check that out. Yes, and make sure you send us those farm stories. If you have a farm story that you think your fellow listeners could laugh at or learn from or just to warm our hearts, we want to hear it. So send them to us via direct message on Instagram or email them to us at drinkandfarm@gmail.com. at gmail.com. Well, thanks for listening, guys. 
We really enjoy doing this podcast for you, and we hope that you enjoy listening. So thanks for being here. You have no idea what it means to us to get to share with you. Yeah, we, we have a good time doing this. So drink. Farm. And, and give, give zero, zero clucks. clucks. Bye, guys. Bye.